If you were telling the best story ever told, how would you start? Come and listen to my story about a man named Jed. A poor mountaineer barely kept his family fed. Just sit right back and you'll hear a tale, a tale of a fateful story. A story of a lovely lady who was bringing up three very lovely girls. Now this is a story all about how my life got flipped, turned upside down. Those are great ways to tell a tale. But what do you say when it's not make-believe? You say, true story. Quick confession, 15 years ago when I was starting out in ministry as a student pastor and just teaching students on Sunday mornings and also Wednesday night, I gravitated a lot towards the New Testament. Um, I found myself teaching a lot from the Gospels, um, the letters that Paul wrote, um, the, the epistles, you know, and, and things like that. It just, I just felt like there was a whole lot more application for students in the New Testament than the Old Testament. Now, don't judge me. I never would have said this, but my actions portrayed that I believed that the Old Testament just wasn't as important. All right, don't, don't no shame looks, Okay. Um, I've, grown, I've grown a lot since then, um, a deeper understanding of, of the Old Testament. But my, my thinking was, it's the Old Testament, right? It's like the old iPhone. <laughs> who, who cares, right? It's outdated. Let's move it. Let's get the new one, right? This is the New Testament. It's the new covenant. Uh, we're, we're living in grace, and there's just a whole lot there. Listen, and you can study your entire life, the New Testament, but let me tell you something. The Old Testament gives validity to the New Testament. We cannot fully understand the New Testament scriptures without first understanding the Old Testament scriptures. And so do not fall into the trap that I fell into, that the Old Testament meant unimportant. It's so important. It's so important. Um, about 25 to 30% of the Bible, um, depending on how you want to calculate it, is prophecy. Turn to your neighbor and say prophecy. Right? Not, a, not a word that, that we use um, a whole lot just in everyday language. Prophecy is just the, it's the, it's the truth telling of God. Um, and many times the, the prophecy was um, God revealing to us things that were to come. Now, I'm not sure that I want God to tell me what's coming in the future, right? Um, not because I don't want to know. I, I just feel like it would be a detriment to, to me. Like I would try to manipulate things and, you know, it's kind of like watching a football game. When you know the outcome, it's just not as fun. I'd rather just live every day. Who knows what's going to happen, you know, um, but I'm not sure that I would, I would like that. And so I always like to ask the question why. We're going to ask the question why a couple of times today. Why would God tell us future events? Why would he do that? Let me give you three quick reasons. Number one, he does it as a warning. Um, just an example uh, to a guy named Noah. Hey, Noah, flood's coming. It's prophecy. Right? Here's what is going to happen. I am revealing to you future events that serves as a warning to prepare, build a boat. Right? Um, a second reason that God gives us prophecy um, is to validate who he is. In Isaiah chapter, we're going to be in Luke chapter 24, by the way. Uh, but real quick, in Isaiah 41, verse 23, here's what, the God says. here's what God says. And he's speaking through Isaiah, and he's talking to the, uh, to the false gods. And he says, tell us the coming events common um, false god in the Old Testament is Baal. Hey, Baal, tell us what's going to happen in the future. Then we will know that you are gods. It's like God's kind of putting, you know, the little g gods to the test. Go ahead, tell us what's going to happen tomorrow. Ask Baal. Guess what? He doesn't know. He doesn't talk, um, by the way. Ask Buddha what's going to happen in the future. Guess what? He has no idea. Ask God what's going to happen in the future. Guess what? Not only does he know, but he knows with absolute certainty down to every single detail. So because he knows, listen, that's the God I want to worship. That's the God I want to, I want to serve, is the one who can see all things past, present, and future. There's a third reason that God gives us prophecy, a third reason that God tells us what is to come, and that is to give us confidence in who the Messiah is. God tells us that um, in a point in time in human history, this um, God would come and he would enter into humanity. And he would be the redeemer of all mankind. He would bring salvation. The scripture says that the governments would rest upon his 
shoulders. Now, this is good news for us if you're frustrated with government at any point in your life. Um, there's got some good news for you. There's, there's a government coming one day, right, where Jesus Christ is ruling and reigning forever and ever and ever and that's going to be awesome. We talked about it in our men's group. Uh, we get to trade in our plow. Or we get to trade in our uh, swords for plowshares, right? We just get to work, right? We, we we can live in peace because we know that hey, he's going to handle it and he's going to execute with perfect judgment and perfect execution. Um, and I want to be on his team. I want to be on on his side. And so. We need to have confidence in who the Messiah is because there have been a lot of people that have come forth, especially around the time of Jesus. There are a lot of people that stepped forward and said, I'm the Messiah. It's me. Now, they had some followers. They had some people that kind of gravitated towards them. Now, eventually they, they died and they dissipated. But then we have this man named Jesus Christ come forward and basically say, look, I am the Son of God. I'm the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And people gravitated towards him. So how can we know with complete confidence today in 2021 that Jesus Christ really was the Son of God? If you have doubts, and I'm sure in a room here, if you're watching online, look, if you have doubts, I want to introduce you to a couple of people in Luke 24. Uh, before we do, quick illustration. Um, I have this jar, and in this jar are 10 slips of paper. Each slip of paper is numbered uh, 1 to 10. Judson, would you mind helping me out, man? Is that okay, Mom? All right, come on up here, Judson. Can you hop up here real quick? I picked you because you got a cool hat on today. <laughs> What's up, man? Having a good day? Happy October 31st. Yeah? All right, cool. You're excited to be here, huh? <laughs> yeah, I can tell. All right, so I want you to pick out number one. All right, they're numbered one to ten. I want you to pick out number one. What are the odds that he picks out number one? One in ten, right? Ten percent chance. All right, here we go. Don't look. All right. All right, let's see what you got. Let's show the audience. Dude, it's number one. <laughs> High five. All right. The guy in the first service, totally bombed. He totally failed. Let's put it back. Wait, no, hey, don't leave yet. You, you need to go? You, you need to go? You need to be somewhere? All right. Not really? All right. What are the odds that he now picks out number two? What are the odds? It's not one in ten. It's one out of a hundred. Someone said it. One out of a hundred that he would actually pick it the second time. I hope this illustration works out. <laughs> you got to be kidding me. <laughs> Don't go anywhere. You keep drawing the right cards, man. Okay. You got to keep hanging out here with me. Mix them up a little bit. Man, I hope this illustration works. <laughs> We didn't get to level two in the first service. You're at level three. What are the odds that he picks out number three? What are the odds? You're, you're batting one in a thousand right here, buddy. Go ahead, pick out one. All right, let's see what it is. No? Oh, four. Uh, uh. Y'all give Justin a hand. So what are the odds that someone um, would pick one all the way to 10 in consecutive order? What are the odds? Let me help you out. One in 10 billion. One in 10 billion that one person would do what we just did and pick out 10 in a consecutive row. There are over 300 prophecies about the Messiah, about the, the person who would enter into human history and be the redeemer of mankind. 300, not 10, and not vague prophecies, okay, but very specific, very detailed, prophetic words in the Old Testament. Listen, the Old Testament gives validity to the New Testament, but you might be skeptical, and that's okay. I'm glad you're here, I really am. Um, pray that God would move in your heart today. We're gonna uh, look at two people in Luke chapter 24 who are also skeptical. They weren't sure. In fact, what we'd find them doing is they're walking back home uh, to their, their town called Emmaus, and in a lot of ways, they've kind of given up hope that Jesus really is the, the Savior and the Son of God. 
uh, Luke 24, verse 13. Now, the same day, two of them were on their way to a village called Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. Um, unless you're a runner, you know, you're, you're probably not used to just, you know, taking off for, on a seven-mile trip using your legs. Uh, but this was very common. It's, this was not a big trip, okay? Um, they're probably there in, in, in half a day or so. Um, but there's two of them. They're, they're, they're two disciples. We get the name of one of them in a second. Um, it's most likely that they're just two guys, two friends, two disciples, followers of Jesus. But it, it could also be likely that they're a married couple. Okay, I'll explain that in just a second. Verse 14, together they were discussing everything that had taken place. Now we jumped into Luke 24. What's well, already taken place, kind of the context, is we have the death of Jesus crucified on a cross. We have his burial, and then we have um, witnesses to his, his resurrection. So those are the events that had just taken place over the last um, you know, couple of days. And while they were discussing and arguing, this is why that might have been a married couple, okay? <laughs> Not newlyweds, perhaps. While they were discussing and arguing, um, that's a joke, by the way, Jesus himself came near and began to walk along with them. Jesus just shows up. Shows up in their midst, the two become three, and they're walking along on this road to Emmaus. But they were prevented from recognizing him. They were prevented from recognizing him. Um, why? Why? Again, I'd like to ask the question why. I think we ask the question why, and we dig in, God reveals, and we, we get to learn a lot about, about who he is. Why would Jesus prevent them from seeing him? Now, there were Pharisees, okay, religious leaders, who didn't recognize Jesus. They had eyes, but they couldn't perceive. They had ears, but they didn't hear, right? They missed it, completely missed it. But it was because of their own lack of faith. It was their own unbelief. They were the ones that put up the wall that hindered them from seeing Christ. These disciples don't have that wall. They're prevented. So this is something that Jesus intentionally does to obscure himself from them recognizing that it's, that it's Jesus. I don't know if he's wearing a, a mask or you know, a Halloween costume or, or something like that, but he does, he does something okay, to prevent them from seeing him. And we're going to ask the question why, and I think we'll have a, a, a good answer later on. Verse 17, but he asked them, what's, what's this dispute that you're having with each other as you're walking? And they stopped walking and looked discouraged. This was a big deal. Hey, guys, what are y'all, what are y'all fussing about? And they pause, and they begin to examine, and they're discouraged. Because, listen, their, their world had just been turned upside down. The man that they believed to be the son of God was killed on a cross. He was murdered. I want you to think about that. Think about, think about your best friend. Think about the person, the mentor, the leader in your life that you really look up to. Imagine witnessing that person publicly humiliated, crucified, and put in a tomb. And there was so much discussion about his life and people perhaps stealing his body and things like that. And then you wake up on, on Sunday morning and there's testimony that, that his body is gone. You're wondering what in the world is going on. These guys are, are discouraged. And the one named Cleopas answered him, are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that happened here in these days? Are you kidding me? You have to be the only person in this entire region who has not heard what's going on. This lets us know that the crucifixion of Jesus was not some little secret thing on the corner of town. Public. Darkness for three hours on that day. Earthquake on that day. The temple veil torn in two. Remember, remember 9-11 for, for those of you? Like it's, everyone was tuned into the news. Everyone was talking about it. You talked about it at home. You talked about it with family. You talked about it with friends. Like It was a big event. This was the event surrounding the crucifixion and burial of Jesus. Are you kidding me? Are you the only traveler, the only stranger who, who doesn't know? Verse 19, what things? Don't you love Jesus? Yeah, what? What things? Go ahead, tell me. What's he doing? He's fishing it out of him, isn't he? You tell me. Hey, what happened? So they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, powerful in action and speech before God, and how our chief, uh, before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. 
What things? Here are the things. Jesus of Nazareth. So they identify the person. Not to be confused with any other Jesus or Jesus or whatever, right? Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet. Did you catch that? It's past tense. He was a prophet. And he was powerful in action and speech, but they turned him over, uh, religious leaders turned him over, and they killed him. They murdered him. They crucified him. I want you to think about it. Let's just pause here and, and think about the implications of what, what these two disciples have just said to Jesus. He was a prophet, powerful in action and speech. The, the prophets of the Old Testament, guess what? They were powerful in action and speech. Quick example, Moses, prophet of God, right? Speaks on behalf of God, powerful in action, right? Parts the Red Sea, leads the people out of Egypt. Powerful in action, powerful in words before God and before people. But here's the thing, Moses died. Let's fast forward to a, a prophet named Samuel. Samuel was powerful in action. There was a time when it hadn't rained, and so he prayed that God would send rain, and it happened, and it rained for the next three days. Whew. Powerful in action, right? Powerful in words. Samuel died. Should I keep going? Okay, cool. Um, Daniel. Daniel was a prophet. Powerful in action and speech. I'm not, ba I'm not bowing down to King Nebuchadnezzar. I'm going to keep praying to the one true God powerful in action and speech. And here's the thing, he died. What about Isaiah? Powerful in action and speech. He healed a man by the name of Hezekiah, added 15 years to his life. Powerful in action and speech. But guess what? He died. So what are they saying? This man, Jesus, he was a prophet. They're taking Jesus and they're lumping him into the same category as all those other prophets who were powerful in action, powerful in speech, and they died. And here's what their fear is. Their fear is they missed it. In fact, they go on to explain, verse 21, but we were hoping that he was the one who was about to redeem Israel. Besides all this, it's the third day since these things happened. We were hoping that he was the one. Here's what they're saying, but they didn't say. They, what they wanted to say was, he's not the one. We thought he was, we were hoping he was, but he's not. Because he was a prophet, and he died. They crucified him, they killed him. Besides, it's the third day. What does that mean? Well, Jesus said that on the third day he would rebuild the temple, right? That threw everyone into a tizzy. And they were expecting him to take a political reign. They were expecting the Messiah to be the one that overthrows the Roman government and take his seat as president. And here's the thing. Jesus had bigger plans than to be president of a nation. With the utmost respect to the highest office in the world, the president of the United States, He's a shift manager <laughs> compared to King Jesus who sits on the throne in heaven at the right hand of God and will come back ruling and reigning for a period of a thousand years and ultimately for all eternity. He's a shift manager. Sorry, I got sidetracked on that one. Moreover, some women from our group astounded us. They arrived early at the tomb and they didn't find his body. Again, there was a lot of confusion about was, he, was his body stolen? You know, what happened to him? Uh, they came and reported what they had, that they'd seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and they found it just as the woman had said, but they didn't see him. I love that. They didn't see him. You see the irony here? Who are they talking to? Jesus. But they don't see him. <laughs> they totally miss it, Right? Again, we're asking the question, why? Why does Jesus disguise himself? Verse 25, he said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all the prophets have spoken. Jesus doesn't mince words, okay? He doesn't sugarcoat it. You fools, you're slow of heart to believe. I wish I had that gusto, you know, sometime when someone comes and says, hey, Andy, I'm going through this hard time and I, I believe God, but you fool, you're slow to believe. I would probably not get a lot of counseling appointments, <laughs> right? If I, if I truly mimic Jesus. You know, I've got this child and they're just wandering astray. I, I know God's got it, but I'm just, you know, I just need to worry. I'm just like say, you fool, you're slow to believe. And we can get all kinds of apl application there, but Jesus just calls it like it is. He calls their, their, their bluff. Wasn't it necessary for the Messiah to suffer these things and enter his glory? Wasn't this supposed to happen? 
Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted for them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. Now, there's a lot of sermons that are recorded that Jesus gives. We get details, you know, the, the Olivet Discourse, you know, Sermon on the Mount. Why is this one left out? When we get to heaven, it's like, remember that sermon you did with those two people on the road to Emmaus? Let's replay that one. I bet that was a good one. He starts with Moses. He continues through all the prophets. Moses writes the first five books, Matt, uh, not Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Um, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, right? I would love to sit in a lesson from Jesus on Deuteronomy, right? Work through Numbers, Jesus. I bet he started um, with that, that first curse that God gives the serpent. You're going to crawl on your, on your belly. And speaking of the, the seed of woman that would one day come, he says, you'll strike his heel, but he'll crush your head. Maybe Jesus began to explain how that, that death on the cross was Satan trying to thwart God's plan. He was striking at the heel of the Savior. But when Jesus Christ rose from the grave, guess what he did? He was crushing Satan with a deadly blow. Maybe he moved from there to Abraham, the covenant, the promise that God made to Abraham. I will make you into a great nation, and all the nations of the earth will be blessed through you. And maybe Jesus had to shed some light on that, that it was through the, this death on a cross, through the, the Jewish line, through this Jewish nation, through the nation of Israel, that now all the nations could experience the blessing and the promise of eternal life and the hope that we have through Jesus, Messiah. Maybe he went on to that to talk about that story of Abraham being asked by God to sacrifice his, his only son. And he's there on the altar. God provides a ram as a substitute sacrifice. And Jesus begins to teach about what substitutionary atonement is, right? He begins to teach them that, look, if, when there's a price that needs to be paid, you can have someone stand in as a substitute, and it's good. God accepts the substitute. And Jesus' penalty on the cross is the substitute for our death that we should pay. And they're looking at this, and they're like, whoa. And then from there, maybe he moves on to that very first Passover when Israel was in Egypt, right? And they're asked to take a, a lamb, a spotless, pure lamb, and slaughter it and take the blood and paint it over the doorposts of their house. And when the death angel come, he would pass over that house and that, that household would be redeemed. They would be saved from death. And then maybe Jesus related to them how this was Passover week that had just taken place. And Jesus was the lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world because his blood would be shed on a cross, much like a doorpost. Maybe from there he moved on to King David, who writes this beautiful song, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And he ties into how Jesus echoed the words, I am the good shepherd, the one who lays down his life for the sheep. What does that mean to lay down your life? It means you die, you give up for them. Like, oh, I get it. Maybe he moved on to the story of King David praying to God, saying, I want to build a house for you. And God says, no thanks. I don't need a house, a little temporary shed on the earth. <laughs> I'm going to build you a house, David. I'm going to build your kingdom. In fact, your heir will sit on the throne forever. I'm going to establish your kingdom. And he uses the word forever. How long is forever? It's forever. <laughs> it's today too, right? So that means that if God holds up to his word there should be someone from the tribe of Judah. There should be a son of David sitting on the throne. Guess what? Jesus is the son of David. And you can see that genealogy listed for us in Matthew chapter 1. It's there. He's the king that sits on the throne forever. Maybe he's fast-forwarded to Isaiah and the prophecies that said he would be pierced for our transgressions, crushed, bruised for our iniquities. The punishment of sin would fall upon him. And Jesus talked about Remember when they pierced his hands and his feet? By his stripes we are healed. Remember when they took the, the whips and they striped his back and the, they beat him and, and he was bruised? Maybe he talked to them about the prophecies that, that the Messiah would be crucified between two thieves. And they're starting to picture it because they had just been there. There were two thieves hanging on the cross next to Jesus. Maybe he brought up the, proce the prophecy about how the Messiah would be mocked and ridiculed. And how they placed a crown of thorns on the head of Jesus and they laughed at him and saying, here's the king of the Jews. 
Maybe he talked about how the, the prophecy that the soldiers would cast lots for his clothes. And as Jesus is hanging there on the cross, guess what the soldiers are doing? They're playing poker for some bloody garments. Maybe he talked about the prophecy that not a bone in his body would be broken, that his side would be pierced. And these disciples, they're hearing it. That happened, that happened, that happened, that happened. Maybe he brought up the prophecy about how this savior would be buried in a borrowed tomb of a rich man. They remembered, oh yeah, it was that rich guy that offered up his tomb to bury Jesus so they could get in the grave before the Sabbath day. Maybe he talked about the sign of Jonah being in the well for three days and then coming forth. And as he's talking about each and each, every single one of these prophecies, listen, they're sitting there listening. And later on, the scripture says their hearts are burning within them. Why? Because they get it. What are the odds that this takes place? Not one in 10 billion. Those are better odds. One in 10 to the 17th power. Virtually impossible. It's kind of like this. Um, prophecies were, were like arrows of truth. Let me use an illustration, for example. So, born of a virgin was an arrow of truth that a prophet shot up into the air, and he had no idea where it was going to land. He didn't know who that virgin was going to be. But he's speaking on behalf of God. Born in Bethlehem, an arrow of truth that was shot up into the air. The prophet not knowing where it was going to land. Coming out of Egypt is an arrow of truth that was shot up. Now, how's a guy going to be born in, in Bethlehem but come out of Egypt, not knowing where it was going to land? From Nazareth, an arrow of truth shot up as a prophecy into the air. So 300 of these arrow, arrows over 2,000 plus years were shot up into the air just waiting to be fulfilled. And guess where these 300 plus arrows land? They land on one man. His name is Jesus. You know what bothers me? It bothers me when people look at Christians and say, you use Jesus as a crutch. That bothers me. As if believing in Christ is like the easy route. Like it's easier not to believe, don't you think? It's easier to just turn a blind eye to the evidence. And people will say, How can, can you really trust what a guy said 2,000 years ago? I'll answer that question for you in just a second, but I want to ask two questions. Here's one. Can we really believe what a guy named Muhammad said 1,400 years ago? I mean, he wrote a book from start to finish and established a, a belief system, and, and people believe it. One guy. How do we know he's not telling the truth? How do we know he's not lying? Or how about this one? This might get closer to home. Are you really going to believe what some guy 200 years ago said by the name of Charles Darwin? Are you really going to put faith in what he said? Oh, but Andy, that's science. Here's Darwin's science. Here's what he wrote. He was sitting on an island. He saw two birds with different sized beaks, and he said, they must have evolved. And there he goes. This is his hypothesis. This is his theory. Can't be reproduced. You can't experiment and, re and, and recreate that. It's not really observable, and it's certainly not reproducible. So there's no science in it whatsoever. It's a guy on an island saying, what if? And yet the world eats it up and believes it. Why? Because it rejects God. That's why. Now, I'll answer the question. Can you really believe what a guy named Jesus said 2,000 years ago? Absolutely. <laughs> Not because he said it. But because there were prophets hundreds of years before him, thousands of years before him, that were throwing up these arrows of truth, and they all come landing down on him. Listen, and these aren't things that Jesus could manipulate. Jesus isn't in the background going, let's set up the stage here. Let's have two thieves on each side. Hey, make sure they don't break my bones when they kill me. He's not manipulating this. Hey, um, I want to be born of a virgin. <laughs> I want to be born in this particular town. He, how's he going to manipulate that? As a one-year-old baby, when King Herod puts out a decree to kill all the uh, males around Bethlehem two years and younger, Jesus isn't orchestrating this. But it's God in his foreknowledge, knowing that it's going to happen, so he tells us so that we could have confidence knowing that Jesus really is the Messiah. Why does Jesus disguise, him, disguise himself to these two disciples? 
This is our answer. Jesus very well could have showed up and said, hey, look, it's me. Do you believe? They have to, right? Like Thomas. Hey, Thomas, here's the nail-scarred hands. Here's this opening in the side. Stick your hand right here. Thomas says, Lord, I believe. Hey, it's great, Thomas. You believe because you see? Blessed are those who believe yet don't see. And here we have this story of two disciples that don't know they're talking to Jesus. But they have to accept by faith all the things that were told about him in the Old Testament, in the scriptures, and it comes to reality, and they have no choice now but to believe. Wait, wait, wait. We're not going home having missed it. We're going home realizing that the blindness was in our own eyes. We see now that Jesus Christ really is the fulfillment of these prophecies. Now, there are some, guess what? There's some truth, there's some arrows, some truth arrows still up there. <laughs> they're still up there. Let me tell you something. They're going to be fulfilled. Just as surely as Jesus Christ fulfilled those prophecies, every single prophetic word in God's word will ultimately be fulfilled. They came near the village where they were going. Oh, wait, I think I missed a point. Yeah, here's the, here's the answer to the question. Why did Jesus disguise himself? Because he wants to know, will you believe without seeing? That's what he wants to know. Will you believe without seeing? So we can be here today on October 31st, 2021. We can believe without seeing. Because we have the exact same message that Jesus used when explaining himself to these two disciples. They came near the village. Now we'll wrap up the story, uh, the true story. They came near the village where they were going, and he gave the impression that he was going farther. But they urged him, stay with us, because it's almost evening, and now the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. It was as he reclined at the table with them that he took the bread, he blessed and broke it, and he gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, but he disappeared from their sight. Then their eyes were opened. I love that. When were their eyes open? Then. <laughs> After what? Now, there's two ways that you can look at this. I, you know, we can, don't hate me if you don't completely agree with this. That's cool. Maybe their eyes were opened as soon as Jesus broke the bread and blessed it. That's kind of how the scripture reads. That's good. But I think there was something that happened before that that initiated this. What did they do? They invited him in, didn't they? They invited him in. Jesus, he's not going to force himself in their home. And he's not going to force himself on your life. I've heard people say, well, if Jesus would just show up to me, like if he'd just show up in a room and tell me who he is, then I'll believe him. No, you won't. <laughs> you come up with some excuse. Oh, I was dreaming, you know. I must have been high. You know, there was something else going on. It wasn't really him, right? If someone pulled a prank, we'll use every, we'll, we'll, we'll try to rationalize it. So he's not going to force himself. What does he do? He waits for them to invite him. He just pretends like he's going to go on. All right, see you guys. They're like, whoa, 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 where are you going? Stay for dinner. We want to hear more. So they invite Jesus into their home, and then he breaks bread, and their eyes are opened. Listen, the scripture says this in, in the book of Revelation. Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. He's not banging it down. He's not intruding in. He's waiting for an open invitation. And here's what he says. If anyone opens the door, I'll come in and I'll break bread. That's what he did for these disciples. He broke bread with them and their eyes became open and they recognized not just, oh, we're talking to Jesus. They recognized, oh, we were right. He really is the son of God who takes away the sin of the world. And they could say that with absolute confidence. So my question to you is this. Will you believe without seeing? Will you believe without seeing? Romans chapter 10 says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, the message of Jesus Christ. Will you believe without seeing?